the boat was originally built to go out and anchor, basically. And other boats that were catching seafood would come up to her and she would be used almost like a barge and then take the catch into port. You know, as a yacht, she has a vastly different role. She was built as a work boat and built for a specific purpose. So converting her to a yacht, it has a challenge in that, you know, uh, system requirements are different. Longevity uh, out on, you know, doing intercoastal runs from, you know, from Florida to Maine, that's a different requirement of the hull, of the systems, of the engine, of the fuel capacity, of, you know, everything associated with the operation of the boat. thing about the Coastal Queen is she's a classic Chesapeake Bay dead rise construction which consists of uh, a four and a half planking system on frames above the chine in the top sides but in the bottom of the boat from the chine to the keel is a cross planking system which carries the transverse structure instead of frames. I think the significance about the Chesapeake Bay system of building and the Chesapeake shape is that it's one of only a handful of very indigenous American craft in that it has no influence from European countries uh, or Native Americans, either one. So there are only a handful of boats like the Adirondack Guideboat is one, the uh, Pride of Baltimore as a, as a blockade runner, the by boat, uh, the skipjack, all of those boats were, uh, they were very efficient to build, they were inexpensive to build, they were built out of the materials at hand. Because it was a working boat, it was built inexpensively. Uh, it was not an inexpensive vessel at the time, but it was built as efficiently as possible. And so the planks running in this direction were done because of availability of materials. So you could have real short planks. You didn't need these long lengths, which are really coveted in, in wooden boat building especially, uh, but also in house construction and it would have been a competition for the manufacturing process. But also the boat could be planked or repaired, but with you know someone with relatively little experience. They could be a woodworker, but maybe they weren't a shipwright. Maybe they didn't have this skill set that was really expansive. And so you had, you know, a scenario here or a planking schedule, as they refer to it as, that allowed a relatively inexperienced person with maybe some oversight uh, from a more experienced shipwright to lay out the bottom and plank the boat. Little video of the queen coming out of the water. We lifted it out of the water. She came to us. She can't be hauled uh, on travel lift straps like a normal soft chine boat would because the straps just sort of catch at the wrong angle here and she would end up getting her hull crushed in. So we have this steel cradle. It's a 20,000 pound cradle that is meant to be picked up by the standard travel lift straps, dunked in the water, and then the boat floats over the top of it. At that point, we lift the cradle up, just kiss the keel, and then a diver's in the water and he adjusts all the boat stands here that are attached to these crossbars um, until they sit tight against the hull. And at that point, we do a final check and then the travel lift is able to lift the entire mess, the cradle as well as the boat all together uh, out of the water. I'm the head shipwright at McMillan Yachts. My name is Clark Poston. I'm in charge of a crew of half a dozen shipwrights and another half a dozen furniture builders and cabinet makers. And we maintain a fleet of about eight or nine boats, the most recent of which is the Coastal Queen. 
the buy boat that has just come under our roof that's going to get a new bottom. The way that this boat was planked, it made it easy to replace a plank, but what it also did is it exposed the end grain to the outside world. That enabled you to, to get the plank off and get a new plank in without it being captured by another piece of lumber, but it also enabled worms to get into the end grain very easily. The worms go into the end grain of the wood as opposed to the, the side of the wood or the edge of the wood. They love going in the end of it. And so this boat has a lot of worm damage as a result of the planking in the bottom being sent past the planking in the top sides and just cut with no rabbit joint. We're going to make a little tweak there. We're gonna do one of two things. Uh, the, the chine log, or the, the structure that creates this chine, uh, we're either gonna move that to the outside and create a rabbit that the top planking as well as the bottom planking come up into and so their end grain is then protected by a solid piece of wood. Or if that structure when we get in there is good and we wanna leave it, we're gonna take this top planking and bring it a little further down and create a rabbit in the bottom of it where the bottom planking can dive into, again, protecting the majority of the end grain uh, that could be exposed you know, to the ocean. And ultimately, if there was some failure in, in some of the paints or something along those lines, uh, you know, being exposed to be eaten by worms. <laughs> The purpose of this restoration is to return the boat to full service and full commission. Working on any classic is a cool thing and it's why we're here and this is no different than that. You know, We have restored a lot of really significant pre and post-war classic wooden yachts over the years. This boat has a lot of character. It's essential that we don't change the character of the boat. It hasn't necessarily operated in as an aggressive uh, scenario as it probably will and so we have to think about that. We have to think about the idea that it, if it works don't mess with it but also what's the future of the boat look like and we've got to sort of balance those things and not screw up the character of the boat in the process. Mm -hmm.